Hey guys, Laura Davos here. I'm just chilling and I thought I would do another book review for you guys since the first one was so popular. Now this book actually came out a few years back. Uh, it is Night Side of the Runes by Thomas Carlson. Uh, I bought this book for $30, which is not a bad price for a nice hard cover with a pretty dust jacket book that is so chock full of great information. The side has beautiful silver. If you don't like dust jackets at all, it'll still look really pretty on your bookshelf. Possibly even a little bit more inconspicuous than this here would on your bookshelf. If you like a more subtle bookshelf. Anywho, moving on to the actual content. Um, this is all about Sigurd Agrel and the Uthark. Um, Stephen Flowers, a.k.a. Edred Thorson, uh, writes a lot of forewords in this book. I really feel like it's almost a bit of a passing of the torch, kind of. Um, not that Edred Thorson is so important to pass the torch on to Carlson. It's not like they're not both uh, strong academics in their field, but to American runic readers, Thorson has a certain level of trust built with readers. And so seeing his work here, especially using his academic publishing name, Flowers, whereas Thorson is his occult name, his occult pen name, uh, seeing his academic pen name also kind of tells you that this is going to be a very academically minded um, occult book on the runes. And it certainly delivers that um, to us. It gives us great information about um Dr. Sigurd Agrel and um, how he kind of figured out the Uthark as being possibly the original um, runic alphabet formation, right? So basically what the, what the Uthark does that is different from the Futhark, and this is Elder Futhark that we're talking about in this book. So we're not talking about Younger Futhark or other runic alphabets. It's only the Elder Futhark, which is the most common one. Um, so we're talking about moving the Fehu rune to the end of the alphabet and starting with Ur instead. Now, why is that so important? Uh, it's important because people will do different groupings of the runic alphabet uh, in order to get more meaning out of it. So an A tier is a group of eight. All right, so you'll take the first eight runes, that's a group. Second series of eight. The next eight runes is the second. The last eight runes is the third A tier. And all of the runes in an A tier have a common theme. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, that is on page 51, I believe. Just page 51, yes, 51. Um, is to do this little ditty here where, um, if it'll zoom in, you take the first rune in the rune row, and the last rune, and you draw an association. The second and the second to last runes in the rune row, and you draw an association. Third and the third to last, draw an association, so on and so forth. And I apologize that my camera doesn't want to focus on this. I really was hoping that it would. But this is just the runic alphabet with the lines drawn. That's really a shame. I'm so sorry that my stupid fucking webcam didn't do that for you. Anyway, moving on. So that is the significance of Uthark as opposed to Futhark. And honestly, seeing other people do the A tier and the numerology, like, you know, first letter is one, second letter is two, and then we're going to do basically Gamatria uh, from the Kabbalah, but with Norse runes. I, none of that ever really felt right to me. It, you know, it all felt super... Um, convoluted and didn't like I didn't really see the associations drawn it, it always felt like such a big stretch but here these associations don't feel like a big stretch to me so after reading this I was like oh these things kind of make sense now uh, these different groupings these a tier these associations between the first and last and so on all those things make sense now they actually do provide me um, depth meaning not just like oh and here's another meaning this weird arbitrary other meaning it is like 
here is a deeper meaning. So Uthar gives you that depth, right? And I am a dabbler, but I'm a depth dabbler, not a surface dabbler. So anything that feels surface or here's some additional but different information about the same thing that is still very surface doesn't compute with me. I want it to go deeper and to add more depth instead of just... Instead of having a large, shallow lake, I want a very deep well. And that is what Uthark gives you. And that is what Edred Thorson gives us. Edred Thorson. Blah, blah, blah. This is what Thomas Carlson, excuse me, gives you in his book. He also gives you an Yggdrasil that looks like the Kabbalah and kind of draws on these ideas of the Kabbalah, but using the nine worlds of Norse mythology. Unlike the Kabbalah, you're not starting at the bottom and going to the top. You're starting at the middle, at Midgard, and going out. Um, and you kind of have to read this whole chapter to really get this diagram and to really get even which worlds, which, which of these runes represent a world, like where these Sephiroth would be the nine worlds like this is Midgard but it doesn't say Midgard on this diagram and they don't it doesn't really explain that well um when he's talking about the different A tier so he breaks up the different pathing exercises into A tier so you're going to start with the Bjarka then you're going to go to the Nauv and then the Ur right and it makes sense that you're going to do it this way work from the middle and go out uh, because in Norse mythology, creation was caused by two opposing divine forces, fire and ice. So you've got Muspelheim and Niflheim as your great apexes of, of deepest depth and farthest journey. Whereas in the Kabbalah, which is a much more monotheistic um, creation belief, you're starting at the bottom and going up to the top single divine um, creational force, right? So it makes sense. And I like how he completely like Nordified it. Like it is, it looks like Kabbalah, but it's nothing like Kabbalah. And he doesn't explain that you have to start at Midgard and go out. That's my kind of common sense assumption, but it is an assumption that I'm making. And it's how I plan on doing it when I get into uh, pathworking that I'm currently on a different meditation routine right now um, that said I go through this book quite often I really really like this book for its meditation it also talks about so the next chapter is man and his souls according to the Norse you have nine different selves one of those selves is your physical self um, and you've got eight different spirits right uh, it's kind of like people who are like, oh, there's three selves, mind, body, spirit. Um, it's like that, except instead of it only being three, there are nine. <laughs> um, and it's intense, but it's actually kind of interesting um, idea. And every, every group that um, participates in shamanism has this idea of multiple souls and multiple selves inside you. Um, so it's also just a very good uh, perspective on your shamanistic practice if you are an eclectic shaman um, or an eclectic pagan. If you're an eclectic anything, this is a great book if you are at all interested in Norse stuff. It might not be the first uh, rune book that you buy, but it will certainly be one of the best. This is all about bind runes and sigils. And you will see that there is a swastika here. Um, yeah, he does explain that that is um, not necessarily, yeah, anyway, we won't get into the swastika, but he does acknowledge that the swastika is not what it used to be, and I do feel like symbols hold on to associations, and I think that the actual rune um, meaning has, has been tainted forever and ever to return. I don't think you can get the same spiritual power out of that rune that you could have gotten pre-Nazi um, Zeit, right? So, anyway, moving on to more sigils and bind runes and such. It's very, very interesting because I've read a lot about, um, oh, in Galder's too. Um, he gives you a ceremony. He talks about the different trees. 
you know, and the sacred meanings of the different trees. Like, he really goes into, like, such depth, right? And, of course, more meditation stuff like what I love and how to make your own tumulus to meditate within. Uh, these are kind of representations of... The Norse loved to do these little uh, pebbles on the ground to make a labyrinth, and it was like a physical metaphor for the, for the labyrinth of the mind, right? The maze of the mind. And he talks about that in such depth. Um, yeah, there's rune yoga in here. He goes into rune divination. And then we have a segue chapter, runosophy and Kabbalah. So this is where he shows you the Gothic Kabbalah and kind of where it came from and Western, what is called Western Gothicism, which is basically what the entire second part of the book is about. Johann Burius and his study of Western Gothicism. So in the Renaissance time, they really did believe that everything came from the same source. And so what they didn't know about the Norse, they filled in with Kabbalah. Uh, they filled in with Greek and Roman pantheon. So a lot of the Norse gods were given one-to-one -one associations with uh, Hellenistic gods. And so that caused a lot of issue and problems and misrepresentations of the Norse gods. However, the whole process is fascinating. So from an academic standpoint, the second half is very good. It's dry. Um, it's not what we know to be true today in most instances, but it is academically fascinating. And this book really does strive to be academically occult and not witchy woo woo pull stuff out of my butt occult, right? I really don't like that last kind of occult book, right? Like I want to know where someone is getting their information from and I want them to cite sources other than just this is what I think and I'm going to present it to you as fact when really it's just what I think. Carlson is very good at not doing that and giving you sources. Um, and pulling directly from mythology more often than pulling from other people, right? So this is just part of that. Uh, this book is academically occult, so it's also going to talk about the history of, like, Western Gothicism. So, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I didn't find anything that I would use in my own spiritual practice in this second part of the book. But considering I found so much useful in the first part of the book, it totally makes up for the second part of the book feeling purely academic and, hmm, well, now I know that kind of historical reading, right? So all in all, this book really completes itself as far as um, that goes. There are some really beautiful block prints in this section. This is Burius's Little Rune Table. I read the bottom of the page for you so you'd know what it was. Um, this is a cover of one of Burius's pamphlets. There are a lot of the covers of his pamphlets. In fact, one of them is exactly, almost looks exactly like um, where Carlson got the cover to his book. I think it's actually more, yeah, here we go. Bye bye. Ta -da. This heart thing back there, that also comes from Johann Burius. So yeah, you get a lot of really, really cool block prints in the second one that are kind of cool to look at. I'm not going to lie. I like old block prints. I'm extremely fascinated by that uh, art style of like those old printing presses and kind of how like you get that like smudginess in it, right? Yeah, and it talks about um, Adol Runa. This is where you get the whole Adol Runa. That kind of went above my head a little bit, um, but I'm going to synopsize it, and I may or may not be wrong in my synopsis, but basically this Adol Rune is supposed to be like the one rune, like the, run, the, the one ring, but like the one rune. So what he does is he takes runes, and he's definitely influenced by 
the other Futharks and the other rune uh, alphabets. He tries to simplify their actual like forms. He simplifies their forms and then combines all the forms together to make this weird heart within a star kind of thing. And of course, these extra lines are just decoration. I think it starts here. So everything within that one circle. So like you can see a rune here. Yeah, you can actually look and find different runes here. So like the R rune, Rytho, boom, boom, boom. There's Rytho. So anyway, he tried to make the one rune. That's what the auto runa is. It's an interesting concept for sure. And it just makes me be like, wow, this is this is what people did before the internet. <laughs> they obsessed on weird occult things. And uh, I feel like, you know, given my own obsessions, that I totally would have been a Johann Burius if it weren't for the internet and modern day distractions because I did do an actual whole study thing on that Yggdrasil Kabbalah I showed in the beginning of the video. And I actually wrote out kind of like what a lot of study Kabbalahs do. They'll have the Hebrew letter. So the runes act as like the Hebrew letter as far as path working goes. Yeah, and it really fits in this um, Yggdrasil path working. I really enjoy it, um, studying it and making those associations and using it to kind of make more sense of Norse mythology and the creation story, right? Whenever you have a visual representation of the nine worlds, it makes more sense uh, when you're reading mythology sometimes. So I do hope that you guys liked this book review. I went really in depth uh, in this one because there was just so much to go in depth about. Um, I hope I didn't give away any secret sauce to this book and that you're still interested in reading all of the key points. There's a lot of material in here for it being a fairly uh, standard size book. There's a lot in it. And I really only just brushed the surface and just showed you what was in it without really telling you any depth about it. Uh, so I hope that maybe you'll go out and get this book. It is available on Amazon, witchy shops, everywhere. It is freely accessible and only $30. So I do hope that um, I have inspired you to get this and that you can find it. If you liked this book review, please hit like so I know that it is a book review that you guys enjoyed. Uh, if you would like to support my channel and see more occult book reviews, please hit the subscribe button. Any questions, comments, and concerns, I will get back to you immediately. And yeah, until next time, happy dabbling and bye-bye.